Hello, Edward. Hi, Bob. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright, publisher of the Non-Zero Newsletter. This is the Non-Zero Podcast. You are Edward Wong. That's a name that's uh, familiar to New York Times readers. You're a longtime uh, correspondent. You're currently a diplomatic correspondent. For, for a while, you were the Beijing bureau chief. Uh, you also cover the Iraq War. And the reason you're here is because you have now published a book. In fact, uh, if I've got the scheduling right, this book is being published on the very day that this conversation will post. Uh, and the book is called At the Edge of Empire, A Family's Reckoning with China. It's a great book in which you uh, kind of intertwine the story of your family history, in particular, the story of your father who grew up in China. Um, with kind of a modern history of China and, uh, and uh, you know, presentation of current Chinese politics and so on. So it's a great way to learn a lot uh, about, uh, about history and the current world situation. Um, I saw a picture that you put on Twitter of you and your father with a copy of the book He's now in his 90s. This must have been very gratifying for you because the, the book actually has a picture of him, uh, a somewhat younger version of him, I would say, because it's back. This is back. It's back when he was in China, right? Right. A um, much younger version. I mean, there's ones from his very early youth. And then I think the key photo, the one that's on the cover of the book, and I'll hold it up for those watching on video here. Um, the uh, the cover of the book has at the top. Yeah, put it right in front of your face because you've got this blurring function on. Put right. it like closer to you, like hug it, like like, and then I think it'll. Uh, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Okay, we're seeing it. There we're you go. It. Great. So at the very top of the book, you see a photo of him, and that's him at age twenty one when he had joined the Chinese army and had been sent out to the far northwest of China, and he had that photo taken in a shop um, out there. And so there's two existing photos of him in a uniform of the People's Liberation Army, and that's one of them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it turns out there really is a lot of natural synergy between his story and the history of China, and you do a good job of uh, making the most of it. But, I mean, for example, you know, currently one thing people are very aware of is the situation of the Uyghurs in, uh, is it pronounced uh, Xinjiang? Xinjiang, right, which means new province. Frontier. New yeah. And, and, you know, uh, one, you know, one thing, the kind of a separatist impulse there, which the Chinese policy is a reaction against, one thing that impulse is a reaction to, I think, is a is a longstanding sense of growing encroachment of Han Chinese culture and, and Chinese politics on the indigenous culture of the Uyghurs. And your father, I mean, not intentionally, but was kind of on the front you know, the frontier of the encroachment in a weird sense. I mean, we'll get to that, right? But uh, he spent a lot of time there and you have spent time there uh, since then because you, uh, I mean, in addition to uh, the, you know, the contact with China that your job at the Times naturally provided, um, you know, you've gone back and, and kind of retraced his uh, footsteps. Um, so I thought I, I want to ask you one question before we go back to square one and 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 go in chronological order, um, which is just that: is there any one thing you hope that people will take away from this, like Americans will take away from this, that would enrich their understanding of China or China's perspective or anything? Um, well, I do think that, um, Bob, as you're well aware, the conversation on China in America these days has become very black and white. And what I hope that Americans take away from the book is, one, that there has been a diversity of viewpoints um, and cultures across China um, throughout modern Chinese history. So that um, as history progresses, there have been these very contingent moments when different viewpoints arise. And so there's no one fixed perspective that um, Chinese leaders or officials or citizens might adopt, but that a lot of it is in reaction to movements within China, in reaction to things that are going on outside China. And so contingency is an important element there in um, Chinese history. And so things are very malleable. Um, I do think that right now we're at a point in Chinese history where um, the authoritarian impulse is very strong. 
and Xi Jinping is really channeling that and pushing that forward. So um, America and other nations, as well as citizens within China, are grappling with that at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, I think that um, one thing that is hard to convey in writing news articles on China is the sense of optimism that and um, hope that many Chinese have had in relation to the direction of the country and to actually central government policies for several decades now. And I think that um, in America, there are many people who look at China, they think it's a police state, they think that people must be under um, feeling an intense form of oppression. I think they view it the same way that they might have viewed the Soviet Union when we were growing up in the 80s um, or so. And so um, that's really not the case in China. In China, um, people, many people have benefited from the uh, decades-long economic boom, a boom that is slowing today, and that many people still hold out hope or optimism in the um, in the policies and in the leadership of the central government. There's a lot of complaints about corruption on the local level in China, but until very recently, people still felt fairly optimistic about the central leadership. I think that has shifted in the last few years um, with uh, Xi Jinping's direction and with the COVID era policies that he put in place um, that in part have led to the economic slowdown. So that's changing now, but um, a lot of Chinese citizens have been optimistic about the direction of the country. And they also feel that it is China's right to take its place as one of the preeminent nations in the world. They strongly believe that um, this feeling of patriotism or nationalism is deeply ingrained in um, a lot of the people who live in China proper. And it is not something that they believe in simply because of government propaganda. I think that in America, a lot of what we talk about, especially here in Washington is, oh, the state imposes this propaganda on people and because of that, they have these like they have these very intense feelings of nationalism. But in fact, um, I feel that there's a very strong grassroots element to that. Um, a lot of it is because of their awareness of Chinese history and of um, the Chinese Empire, the empire that I reference in the title, um, and also of the imperial power um, that China could become again uh, in the coming years. Mm -hmm. Now. The U.S. is kind of famous among other nations, uh, certain kinds of other nations, especially for like lecturing them about how they should conduct their internal affairs. I mean, we would view it as a very you know laudable and noble concern with human rights or with uh, the virtue of liberal democracy or free speech. But sometimes people in those other nations uh, view it as lecturing. Uh, I know Xi Jinping does. Um, is is one thing you're saying that? more Chinese people than we might think, you know, kind of react the same way uh, that, 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 I mean, uh, the bottom line is, is the lecturing counterproductive in terms of its influence on actual Chinese grassroots opinion? Does it tend to only uh, increase uh, the support for Xi Jinping or what? That's a complicated question, Bob, because this is where the um, Chinese media and propaganda apparatus does play a role because the um, the messages that <clears throat> the U.S. tries to deliver to China are channeled through official state media. So then um, sometimes those lines are placed out of context there. The ferocity of them is heightened, obviously, by the Chinese propaganda apparatus. So there, there's a less undiluted view of the messages that America is trying to send to China than we would hope the citizens are getting. But I also do think you have a point in that the constant berating tone of a lot of um, you know, uh, American official statements about China can get on the nerves of ordinary Chinese citizens, even if they heard it in the full context in which it is expressed. And I think they think that their country has come a long ways in recent decades and that the U.S., has exhibited many shortcomings itself in recent decades. Um, we can go back to um, the early 20, uh, 21st century, the Iraq war, or the economic crisis that started in 2008 because of the US financial system. These were huge 
markers for both Chinese officials and for Chinese citizens. And then we see America grappling with its own democratic shortfalls uh, today. And so I think they look at that and they say, who are you to tell us how to conduct our affairs? Yeah. I mean, the question arose for me during the part of your book when I guess it's around the time of the Olympics in Beijing and uh, some French protesters have d done something to convey their disapproval of China's policy toward Tibet. And there are these demonstrations by Chinese people of uh, some French retailer, and they also are complaining about CNN. And I kind of wondered, like, to what extent was that spontaneous? And it sounds to you, to me, like you might say, well, it's a little of both. I, I mean, that, that, the, that the Chinese state-controlled uh, media probably played it in a way that encouraged uh, that encouraged a reaction. And for all I know, there was the the actual kind of manipulative uh, fomenting of a reaction. I don't know by the government. I don't know how those things play out. But do you, did you have a sense observing that, like how authentic yeah. it was? I mean, it's a it's as you're pointing out, it's a complex interaction. So the Chinese state media definitely plays a role. Um, they amplify statements made by, for example, the Chinese foreign ministry. These are the messages that. Um, are being pushed out onto, say, the 7 p.m. news every night um, to people. At the same time, there um, this was at a moment when there was a strong feeling of patriotism or nationalism um, uh, that was arising in China. Um, the Olympics were around the corner. Uh, China, th that was a very symbolic moment where Chinese citizens felt that they were taking um, their place in the spotlight on the world stage. Um, world leaders are about to come for that. And uh, I think they really felt aggrieved by the fact that many people around the world had started criticizing China for uh, its crackdown on uh, Tibet and Tibetan regions at that time. And it was a very real crackdown. There were uh, security forces pushed out to those Western regions and really um, going at it against uh, Tibetan protesters um in those areas because of violent riots that taking place in Lhasa that was a triggering event and so mm -hmm. you had this worldwide reaction to that um there were things like um this movement called anti-cnn started by a chinese citizen online that really galvanized people and that was a grassroots movement that was then amplified by the government so you had this interaction with people and the government will sometimes want to play up these um patriotic protests they want to at least fan the flames of them. But sometimes they want to dial them down too. And they'll try and um, then pull back on the propaganda because they don't want mass protests in their streets. And they know that those can sometimes get out of control, as has happened, especially in nationalistic protests against Japan. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's do get back to uh, somewhere near the beginning of your story. Uh, you know, I would say kind of by way of background, uh, one other thing I, th I think that Americans don't appreciate about some other countries is the extent to which uh, the country's national narratives involve periods of past humiliation or domination, uh, because America has really had it pretty easy when you look at it. We just, by virtue of our geographic circumstance and our power, we just haven't been invaded, you know, or anything. And uh China has had, you know, a series of uh, uh, things happen to it that it turns out America is can be fit into the the narrative like with, including, for example, the the depredations at the hands of the British Empire in the 19th century and so on. But your father's the the story, uh, your your father's kind of childhood story involves a somewhat uh, different uh, kind of affliction that. The U.S. also, in narrative terms, winds up getting wrapped up with in ways we'll discuss. But it's the invasion by Japan, right? So your father, tell the story. Uh, your father is, right. he, now he's in Hong Kong at this point? Yeah, he's in Hong Kong. Um, he He's born in Hong Kong. So he's not born in mainland China. He's born as part of this British colony. So again, that's that points to what you're talking about, Bob, is the that there are these moments in Chinese history where outside empires interact with the Chinese empire and something like Hong Kong was the result of that. So my father in many ways was a product of this clash of empires because he was born in Hong Kong to a middle-class merchant family of Chinese who were living there under British rule. 
Um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Chinese I know who were living in Hong Kong back in those decades had an ambivalent reaction to uh, colon British colonial rule because it was, um, they knew that they as ethnic Chinese could never occupy uh, the place that the British had. Um, and when my father and his family members went to, say, for example, the horse track in Hong Kong to watch the races, they would see the British imperialists out front in the in the best stands, in, uh, dressed up, watching these races, and the Chinese would mostly be sitting behind them. So there are these very concrete elements of that um, that sense of uh, empire intruding on these uh, borderlands of China. So um, then, of course, in World War II, or at, in the Sino-Japanese Wars, they call it, uh, a different empire comes in, which is that of Japan. Um, and it had had uh, very violent interactions with um, China already earlier, but then it seizes parts of China. Of course, it commits uh, mass violence and murder um, in parts of the mainland, and then it takes Hong Kong in 1941, um, right after it attacks Pearl Harbor. So that when it attacks Pearl Harbor, it decides to seize um, certain uh, other imperial holdings of Europeans and the West in Asia and Hong Kong's one of them. And my father lived there for several months under the Japanese occupation. And then um, there was a mass of refugees at that point in Hong Kong from China. And the Japanese started pushing many of them out back into China. And my father and his older brother and other family members went to their home village in southern China. And that was a period and an, and an area where um, both the Japanese military and the nationalist military, the military of the ruling nationalists in China were vying for control. So sometimes, some months, the Japanese would be in control of one area in Guangdong province, and then that same area would come under the control of the nationalists. So was, there was this constant flux of soldiers coming in and out of the area. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, there's a civil war in in uh in china and your father winds up uh well on the communist side of it not out of ideological inclination i guess that's just where he was right i mean it's it's funny you know we 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 i think americans like you know when they think about the way chinese people feel about their government some of them will think well surely they can't support like communism or they can't you know but but people tend not to think of it that way. They just kind of do the patriotic thing. And I think your father's uh, support for the communist side, which as we'll see, waned. Uh, but it was a feeling of patriotism, right? Like how did how did he he ultimately winds up in the People's Liberation Army? And how does he get from this uh, this child who's who's uh, left Hong Kong to be in the PLA? Well, he then finished his school in Guangdong province in the south as the Japanese war was going on and control was going back and forth. And then the civil war then flares up again. Once the Japanese are defeated, the nationalists and the communists go at it. And um, and he starts hearing about the communists down south. I mean, the nationalists still have control of that area, but he knows that they're members of the school, certain teachers who are probably communist sympathizers. Um, he hears about some of the ideas and he's not, as you say, he's not ideological at that point. He's not following, say, Marxist-Leninism and secretly reading about it at night. But there are certain very material and very real elements that do um, take shape in his mind. And one of them is, for example, the corruption of the nationalist government and the poor economic conditions in which he was living. Inflation was sky high. Um, there were many homeless people in the streets. Uh, there was a high unemployment rate. Um, the nationalists had also had a very hard time protecting China against Japan. And so um, people like my father felt that a change of government was necessary in order to strengthen the, the country again and in order to even bring things like jobs and basic services back to the people. So the nationalists, uh, a government that the U.S. ended up supporting, were, was not this paragon of um, of. Uh, fair or just rule that maybe some people in America at the time had thought it was. Instead, it was viewed by the vast majority of Chinese as a corrupt and ebbing power um, in its space in Nanjing. Um, so my father believed that. He believed that there needed to be a change 
in the rulers and in the government. Um, and then he graduated in the first class um, to uh, finish high school under communist rule. That was in 1950. And he went north to Beijing for university. Um, in October of that year, October 1st, he marched in front of Mao in Tiananmen Square with students, with workers, um, with peasants, um, uh, to mark the first anniversary of the People's Republic of China. And, um, and then very soon afterwards, he dropped out of university um, and was admitted to the nascent Air Force because he was intent on going to the Korean Peninsula to fight with the Chinese military against the American forces. And at that time, uh, the Korean War had been going on for several months now. Um, America had entered the war to um, protect South Korea against the North. The Chinese had started sending troops into North Korea. And so you have the first real major war between uh, America and China taking place there on the Korean Peninsula. And my father was intent on fighting the Americans. Yeah, and that war was being presented to the Chinese people by Mao as a defense of China, right? The idea was America, their ultimate goal is to take over North Korea and then invade the mainland. And I don't know to what extent Mao believed that, but I do think it's a common thing for people generally, not just Americans, but it's a famously common thing for countries not to appreciate uh, things they do that are considered threatening to countries that they don't think of as threatening. Like Americans don't think NATO expansion, like why would Putin worry about NATO expansion and so on. Um, and uh, but this was like central to the narrative at the time, right? That the Chinese, right. what we would think of as the Chinese intervention in Korea was to was presented at least as a totally defensive thing. Right. And when the Chinese talk about that war and when they talked about it back then, the phrase that they emphasized was the war against American imperialism, not so much the war against South Korea, but it was the war against American imperialism and in defense of the motherland. And so um, the narrative was that one, America wouldn't stop at the Yalu River. The American troops would eventually come to Beijing and topple the communists and put the nationalists and Chiang Kai-shek back in power. They were um, hiding or uh, in defense, in a defensive posture on Taiwan at that time. And, you know, uh, Mao really amplified that, but he wasn't all wrong, as you and I know, because MacArthur did have designs on mm -hmm. bringing the troop, American troops across the Yalu River, and it was Truman that held him back from doing that. Yeah. No, I'm sure it wasn't a completely crazy idea. And of course, you know, countries in their national security policy are, are kind of supposed to err on the side of caution. So it, was, it wasn't a crazy thing. Um, on the, uh, you know, the Japanese invasion, it, it's kind of funny. You might think that the, fa the role America played in liberating China from Japanese occupation would have put us in the category of good guys. I guess it did for a while, but then two things happened. One is we sided with the nationalists who did not prevail. If they had prevailed, that would have been a good bet, but they didn't. So we became enemies uh, of the Chinese people. And then we became allies of, of Japan. And, uh, and, 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 and I think a number of Chinese are still very cognizant of the historical tension with Japan. There's a scene in your book when there's somebody who I think maybe is an old childhood friend of your father. I may have this wrong. I've just got the block quote here that I've copied and pasted, but it's somebody named... Uh, Zhu, Z-H-U, and uh, you're, you're sitting around kind of talking about old times, and he, and, and he says, there's one bad thing about the United States. They're still allies with Japan. Like, this is way later. He hasn't forgotten. And later in the conversation, uh, he says, America will respect China one day. And I think that's still a very common sentiment, right? That uh, we, w that Americans still don't give China the respect that they are now due, especially in light of their rise uh, over the last couple of decades. Right. And I think, Bob, that line that you hit on about respect is a key one in the book. And that's why I felt that that conversation between my father um, and his high school classmates that I witnessed back in 2012 was important to me because it really showed the mentality of these people who had gone through all the strife in earlier in life. And then they felt that now China had turned the corner, had risen, and yet it was still being seen um, either as a backwards power or as a host, potentially hostile power by 
America and its allies. And they didn't like that. And also the memories of Japan and the Japanese war are deeply embedded in many of the Chinese. And um, for example, my uncle um, who lived in the U.S. and has worked as an engineer for the U.S. government for his entire life um, has a very Chinese perspective on that. He lived through um, those years of Japanese occupation with my father there in China. And he, for many um, parts of his life, he wouldn't buy a Japanese car. Like he wouldn't, he was living here in America, had spent decades here and still wouldn't buy a car made by Japan. And so that type of um, emotional um, uh, valence around Japan is very, very strong. And um, I don't, I'm not saying that as a critique of American policy, because to to me, it makes sense that the U.S. would ally itself with Japan, but you can't underestimate um, how nationalistic or patriotic Chinese feel when the subject of Japan comes up. Mm -hmm. um, so your, your father, uh, he's in the military. Things are going well. He's been selected uh, to, to, you know, he enters the channel that apparently is going to lead him to be in the Air Force, which is a real honor, even though that might, uh, have led him to go to Korea and and get killed, I guess. Yeah. But anyway, that, that, he gets derailed, and this becomes uh, a big a big thing for him, and and ultimately is maybe the beginning of his changing feelings toward the Communist Party. I don't know, but 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 explain what happens. Right. So he um, uh, soon after dropping out of university, he's put into the Air Force. It is a big honor. This is a new arm of the People's Liberation Army. And he wants to be in a bomber squadron sent on missions in to Korea. Um, he gets sent to um, two different schools in Northeast China, in Manchuria, um, to train there, uh, very near the Korean border. Um, but instead, after a few months, uh, he is among several classmates in, at one school who get pulled aside and told that they're not going to continue with their training. And then he's told by senior officers that instead he will then join an army unit that will then be sent west back to Beijing and then further west into the farther reaches of China. And at that moment, he doesn't know exactly where he's going and he soon realizes it along that journey. But um, it's a huge disappointment to him. He doesn't know what happened, um, but he suspects it's because of his family background. His brother went off to study in America instead of staying in China and his parents went back to Hong Kong to live full time there after the Japanese were defeated. So he has these family ties that are deeply embedded in one, a British colony, and two, America, the enemy at the time. And so he suspects that's the cause of that. And I think it's in, uh, this is a thread that follows him um, throughout his time in China. And I think it's it's an important one because it, it, it uh, highlights the fact that the party operates a certain degree on these internal suspicions that they're, they were constantly looking at people's backgrounds. They were judging people on their class backgrounds and on their family affiliations. Um, this judgment took place right around the campaign against counter-revolutionaries when there was were mass purges across China, when many people were rounded up and put in prison or killed. And I think it is these... Um, this suspicion of people's backgrounds that is an important element of the party. It's an important element of this party. It's an important element of other Marxist-Leninist types of parties throughout the world. And I think it left its imprint on many citizens in these countries. Okay. So once he, you know, gets derailed and it becomes clear he's not going to be the Air Force, uh, they kind of march him out West and it it seems like it's it's not really totally clear to him what's happening for a while. Like, is he being exiled? Is it you know a very small group of other uh, soldiers? They're now they're now going to be in the army. I mean, I don't know if the air force was a separate branch from the army to begin with in China, but they're in the army. There's like a half a dozen of them going out west, right? And they wind up uh, in Xinjiang province, now famous for being. Uh, home of the, the Uyghurs, uh, who have been, uh, many of whom have been corralled into these uh, mass internment camps. Um, and this, it is already, China is grappling with the problem of assimilation, right? 
with right. uh, which it is to this day. These are these are uh, Turkic people, uh, Muslims by and large, and uh, they've been kind of on the borders of the Chinese Empire, but now they, China wants this to be part of China, and uh, and they've been grappling with it ever since. But what are some of the early manifestations of that? Um, well, I mean, Xinjiang is very central to the Chinese idea of empire. And that goes back to, I think it goes, uh, the best through line to it is back to the Qing dynasty when the Manchu emperors of China sent uh, armies out to conquer Xinjiang. And they did things like they wiped out a um, uh, uh, confederation of Mongols called the Jungar, for example. And the historians have written about the Jungar genocide. So the idea of seizing this Northwest frontier region and holding on to it has been very important to the Chinese polity since um, the at least the 18th century. And then it was among the first outermost regions of China to be made a province under the Qing dynasty. And so that has left an imprint on both the nationalists and the communists since then. Both of those um, republics um, wanted to uh, basically hold on to the Chinese empire that had been created by the Qing. And the Qing had been a very particular people. They, these were Manchus, not the ethnic Han majority that rules China, but they were Manchus from the Northeast. And they were in this um, wave of uh, conquest that take place periodically throughout Chinese history where um, the nomadic or semi-nomadic people from the north of Ch north of China will then conquer China proper. And the Manchus, because of the people that they were, because of their inner Asian um, heritage and environment, they fashioned this huge inner Asian empire cobbled out of Xinjiang, um, Tibet, uh, many other, Mongolia, many other places, made this huge vast land empire and held onto it. The equivalent is something like the Ottoman Empire, for example. Um, or some of the Eura Euro European empires, the British Empire, the French Empire, that held on to these far-flung territories. And so part of my thinking on China is that it's really the last remaining Eurasian empire because the communists were able to hold on pretty much to most of what the Qing had conquered. And so that's what makes that area so important and why Mao um, back in uh, the, uh, 1949 and afterwards was sending uh, soldiers out there to Xinjiang to basically put it under military rule and military occupation. And my father was among the first waves of those soldiers. Now, this wasn't um, like an honorable posting for these people. Uh, Xinjiang for centuries have been seen as the place of exile um, for people from interior China. And when uh, the court was not happy with officials or with senior um, officers or others. They would send people out beyond the Great Wall into Xinjiang. And it was when my father was in this army convoy going beyond the Great Wall um, in Gansu province that he realized, um, oh, no, this is it. I'm being sent to exile. There's, n there, there's only one destination that I'm bound for, and that's Xinjiang. And so he felt that this might be the last time he ever sees interior China again, that he might die out in Xinjiang and never see his family, his relatives, or what he had grown up around um, for the rest of his life. Um, so he went out there with these soldiers, but then very soon um, he realizes, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to serve the military out here. I'm going to serve the Communist Party, and hopefully I will get back into the good graces and get back into interior China. And he said he and the other soldiers that were sent out there with him, probably many of them had the same questionable class backgrounds as he did, uh, felt the same way, that they wanted to get back into China one day and that they would prove themselves and, and, and end up back there by serving the party. And you know what the thinking was, uh, you know, in Beijing at that point about what the policy was for this province? I mean, I'm, in other words, were, the, were soldiers being sent out there to kind of just subjugate people or was this thought of as part of a longer term kind of assimilation project where you send more and more ethnic Hans out there and slowly the the, the cultures in, intermingle sufficiently uh, so that everything is fine or what? I mean, the policies went through different waves. So 
even under the Qing, the Qing had started encouraging Han migration out there. So that was already something that had been um, in place even before the nationalists and the communists took over China. Um, when Mao first took it over, um, he placed it under military rule. There was a general named Wang Jun who conquered Xinjiang, placed his troops around the area, and he was a very hardline general. And under him, um, they start, the communists started things like um, a so-called land reform policy where they would take land away from religious leaders and religious institutions, for example, away from mosques. There were many Muslims out there away from um, Buddhist um, institutions. They would take land away from nomads and herders in many cases, and that created a lot of resentment. So Kazakh nomads, for example, became very resentful of this. And the year before my father arrived there, um, there was an insurgency led by a Kazakh um, guerrilla named Osman Batur that the communists fought against, and they eventually captured him and executed him. So there were definitely incidents of bloodshed in the conquest of Xinjiang. Um, but at the same time, the policy would, would evolve because, for example, while my father, like a couple of years into his time there, my father realized, wait, I'm sitting here in an army outpost here, but we're not being ordered to do much. We're not being ordered to head out and really um, uh, interact with the population much. And that was for a single year he was there. And the reason was because Mao had decided Wang Jun was cracking down too hard on the local people. He had mm -hmm. sent uh, Xi Jinping, who is the father of Xi Jinping, the current leader, out there to um, really try and corral these uh, military officers who were taking a harder line approach. And Mao at that time thought, we need to somehow put in place policies that um, that win the confidence of the local people. So the solution is a political one not so much a military one, even though he kept in place the military occupation. And so Xi Jinping, the father of Xi Jinping, was supposed to try and enact some of those policies. So the policies changed mm. during that period. Wang Jun, the hardline general, was later sent back to Beijing. So I guess it's kind of ironic that Xi himself now represents a, a swing of the pendulum back toward Oppression, or I guess you might say very, very heavy-handed assimilation or something, I mean, with these internment camps. Do you have a sense for, you know, I mean, how exactly uh, draconian the aspiration is? I mean, are they trying to, like, wipe out Islam or, you know, I mean, I gather that that they, they have some kind of statistical criteria for putting people in these so-called re-education camps. And it has to do with various things that may correlate with extremist Islamic belief or something. And if they come under sufficient, sufficient uh, suspicion, they put them in these camps. And I don't know if we have much of a sense for what the nature of the indoctrination is in there. There is evidence that, that some mosques have been actually destroyed, right? I and mean, many mosques, you, many mosques you, and many Uyghur shrines. So do you have a sense for what the what the plan is and and exactly how draconian it is? I mean, it is very draconian from the reports that we've gotten and from conversations with people who've exited these camps. And a lot of it is, I mean, obviously a lot of it is them being forced to pledge loyalty to the party, which has taken place before throughout party history. Um, but lots of it is also them, for example, in some areas being forced to eat pork, for example, or not mm. fasting during Ramadan. And so these are aren't small parts of Islam. These are central parts of Islam. As you know, fasting during Ramadan is one of the five pillars of Islam, and they're being forced to not follow these at all. And so, um, you know, religion, as you and I know, religion is both about practice and it's about ideas or beliefs. And um, trying to break someone of the practices is um, basically going against the most fundamental tenets of their religion if they are serious practitioners of the religion. And so those are serious things that are taking place in these camps. Um, and in so many cases, the people aren't, there's no um, rational calculus for who gets put in the camps. I mean, there's the estimates are that there have been around 1 million or more people put in these camps or these centers. Um, and you hear stories about uh, that someone just is a, for example, teaches Uyghur culture in a school and they're put in the internment camps because part of it is also not just trying to 
um, tamp down any practices around Islam, but it's also to tamp down Uyghur identity and Uyghur culture. Mm -hmm. So things like um, speaking Uyghur, reading Uyghur, um, Uyghur music, all of those things are, um, they want people to think of Han culture or mainstream Chinese culture as at least on par with that in their identity or even surpassing that Uyghur identity. And it's true of, to a certain degree of the Kazakhs too. They've done this with many Kazakhs as well. Hmm. And so they cycle these people through, I guess they spend a year or two in these camps. And um, you, is there any sense for whether it's working? It doesn't, it seems to me like uh, it could well have the opposite of the intended effect, but uh, do we have any sense at all from whether, from Xi Jinping's point of view, it's working? Uh, I don't know what the leadership thinks of the pol of how successful the from their point of view how successful the policies have been. Um, they have enacted other even harsher policies. The camps have gotten all the headlines, but in fact, they have been putting people in prison, like in the real prison system, in huge numbers, like in numbers that we didn't see a decade ago. And there are many people who are serving sentences of, say, 15 years or more in prison. So they're worse off, actually, than the people who are in the camps. And these happen in large numbers. I spoke to Uyghurs here in Washington who had relatives put in prison sentence for um, things like separatism, uh, which uh, didn't seem like a valid charge uh, based on the interviews I did. And they were put in these prisons. So like, it's not just trying to eradicate the cultural affinity of the people by putting them in camps, but it's also actually taking people entirely out of society um, in some cases and, mm -hmm. and putting them behind bars for many, many years. Yeah. I mean, there is a separatist movement and it has sometimes assumed violent form, but, uh, and that's what, of course, uh, she would emphasize. And of right. course, they took advantage of uh 9-11 in a certain sense, when the U.S. was declaring war on global Islamic extremism. And in fact, the U.S., I don't know if we've rescinded this, but at one point, uh, the U.S. designated this one Uyghur group a terrorist organization, right? Uh, right? I don't know if that's still in effect. But that's the way, you know, she is casting the whole thing. At the same time, the violence in the scheme of things, the violent uprisings have been limited in scale, if only because of the lack of weapons, right? I mean, it's uh, they tend to be these kind of knife attacks and so on. Um, so so it's, it's just hard to say whether where this is headed. Do you have any sense for whether it's, well, do you have any sense for whether the U.S. Uh, sanctions are having any effect? Uh, I don't have a sense of that, partly because the sanctions were put into effect only a few years ago. They're aimed at things like um, supply chains um, and sort of breaking, uh, making sure that U.S. companies don't engage in uh, trade with China that involves supply chains being traced back to Xinjiang, for example. So that's one huge aspect of U.S. sanctions. And I think it's too early to tell the impact that that's having. It certainly hasn't had a policy impact. So, um, Bob, as you know, like oftentimes the U.S. likes to impose sanctions on many um, countries that it doesn't agree with around the world. And it thinks the sanctions will change the behavior of those governments, but uh, it often does not. Um, it often enriches some of the people affiliated with those governments. Um, and in the case of Xinjiang, the sanctions have not yet changed any of the policies. Um, you know, some people could say that at least it's the morally right thing to do, given what we know of what's taking place in Xinjiang. Um, that's, I think that's the argument that some people would make about these sanctions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, anyway, your father uh, winds up uh, establishing a relationship with what the political commissar, the kind of party guy who's overseeing the army unit your father's part of or something and becomes a valued assistant to him. He writes speeches and so on. And your father winds up going to college in China, right? Right. He's, he goes back to Xi'an. So this is, he succeeds in his goal he gets back into interior China because at that time, around 1957, the party was looking for young people who had some talent and some intellectual aspiration to go back to school because they needed to rebuild China at that point. And so um, the Korean War was over um, and they didn't need as many people in the military. So they, my father takes an exam, gets into a university in Xi'an. 
that is affiliated with the Army. Um, and he wants to become an aerospace engineer and build aircraft, ideally for the military, because then it's a continuation of his service um, in the military and of serving the nation. Mm -hmm. And uh, your, your mother's alienation from the Communist Party is pretty straightforward, right? Her family's land, they were dispossessed of their, right away, right after the revolution, uh, relatively affluent people had their land taken away. And so she was kind of on, her family was on the wrong side of the, the deal. Uh, your, but, but your father, say a little more about how he uh, finally winds up uh, feeling, uh, you know, disapproving of the party and alienated from it. Yeah, there's a confluence of events that are both personal and on a grand historical scale, scale that take place when he's at university. Um, he, by the time he left Xinjiang, he was hopeful that he would become a party member. Um, some senior officers had recommended him for the party. So there was this application that was working its way through the system. He thought he had won the confidence of the party and he thought, here I am, I'm going to back to university and soon I'll be in the party and I'll be continuing my service to China. But um, in the early 60s, I mean, so uh, several things take place. One is that he um, is told at one point, um, that his there are still problems with his application for the party, that there are still problems with the fact that he has these family members um, that are overseas, that they have to do a, a further check into his family background. And he realizes at that point that the party has this chronic distrust of him, that party officials have this chronic distrust that in his file are is material that he'll never be able to shake probably. And so he realized there's something wrong with the organization that has seen the sacrifices that he has made and yet still won't trust him. That's And then they also, one summer, his classmates were sent to a factory floor to start getting firsthand experience working on um, aircraft. And he was told he couldn't do that. And obviously it was because they didn't trust him and his presence on this factory floor. So that was a very material sign of the distrust that still that they still had for him. Then at the same time this is all happening, the I mean one of the greatest um, catastrophes in the world was taking place, which is the the great famine that took place under Mao. And this is because Mao had started these economic policies during the Great Leap Forward that were failing. And so 1958 onward, China enters this intense famine. It takes place across the entire country. My father and his classmates start um, begin starving um, on their campus. They barely have any food to eat. Um, they all grow ill. My father is bedridden for months. Um, and then he also starts to wonder about party policy. And there are other things that happen. Mao also, for um, at one point, um, at the start of the Great Leap Forward, um, purges um, one of the senior military commanders that um, Peng Dehuai, that my father had believed in. So my father served in the military. Peng Dehuai was obviously a hero to many people in the military and many other Chinese because he was instrumental um, in the wars that China had fought. And my father wondered why would Mao be purging this commander who has been a hero for China, who has helped the communists, and who was one of Mao's most loyal aides. Um, Peng had spoken out against Mao because Peng had realized the economic policies were failing and Mao decided to purge him at an important party meeting. So there were uh, a confluence of various events taking place across China at the very elite levels of the party and in my father's own internal ambitions that all came to a head there in the late 1950s and early 60s. Okay. So I want to continue the story and explain how you wind up being born in the U.S. Um, and I want to talk about various other things uh, in contemporary politics, including Taiwan uh, and relations between the U.S. and China generally. But um, as regular listeners know, uh, and as you know, Edward, um, what we generally do is uh, talk for quite a while uh, in a public podcast. And then we go into overtime. That's available to paid subscribers of the Non-Zero Newsletter. It's easy to become one of those. Uh, and uh, once you've done that, you can set up your own uh, podcast feed where the overtime segments will always be available. You can always also just 
uh, go straight to the non-zero site on Substack and like immediately, uh, without doing that, listen to the rest of this or watch the rest of this uh, by clicking on the post that represents it. Um, but before we go into overtime, first of all, I want to give you uh, a chance to say anything you want to say by way of summing up. I want to encourage people uh, to get the book and read it at the edge of empire, families reckoning with China. It's brand new. It's it's really a unique perspective. Uh, uh, unique is an overused word, but this is a unique perspective. Um, and you really do a great job of weaving the two uh, the two strands together. Well, is there anything you want to say that you wish you had said already or you want to clarify or anything? Well, I just want to say, as you were pointing out about the strands of the book, that um, when I set out to write this book, it was to tell the uh, entire story of modern China from Mao to Xi. And, um, and it was very tricky figuring out how to work out the chronologies in the book. Um, but I think I uh, figured out that my father's story was the most compelling way of really bringing the reader through all the changes under Mao, even the changes under, to a certain degree, under Deng um, and the economic boom of China, because he meets up with his classmates who have experienced that. And then we get to see, which is what I experienced during my time in China. And we're back in this era when many people are comparing Xi to Mao. There are, there are differences. I think readers who read the book, we'll, we'll see that there are differences between what Xi is doing and what Mao did back in his day, but there are also many similarities. And so what we have to do is grapple with this China that's full of contradictions. And I think that that's one thing I want to present to the reader. Okay, great. Um, so uh, thanks to everybody who's stayed with us this far, whether or not you're going into overtime. Uh, feel free to, uh, you know, smash the like button, rate and review and so on. It really does help. Uh, and, uh, without further ado, we will now go into overtime.